Hey, welcome to yet another webinar. It's been a busy year for us for conducting these web webinars, hasn't it, Dave? Yeah, we've been doing at least one a week and often some weeks we're doing two of them. So yeah, it's been it's been quite a string of them all together. Mm -hmm. It's been great. It has been great. There's been so much interest in all of this live video technology with everybody trying to figure out solutions either from to work remotely or to produce remotely. And uh, it looks like quite a few people signed up for today's webinar about NDI, which is great. Um, I'd say if you're watching this on Crowdcast, say hi in the chat, let us know where you're from uh, and let us know what you want us to talk about today. We have a, an agenda, of course, <laughs> <laughs> but if you have specific questions about NDI or how NDI works on our Perl systems, uh, please uh, put those into the chat. There's a little ask a question thing at the bottom of the Crowdcast window where you can put your questions in there and we will make sure we get to your questions. Um, and hopefully we get a lot of people turning up today to chat with, so it's great. <clears throat> yeah, we so, certainly got a lot of registration, so uh, we expect it'll be a, a busy chat section and questions, which which is always makes for a better webinar when there's lots of people asking questions and getting involved. So that's right. Yeah. Um, well, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's George Birchall. I'm uh, part of Epifan Video, and I'm with the marketing group. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm Dave Kirk, uh, and I lead the marketing group here at Epifan. Uh, okay, um, I left my door open to my room here, so I'm going to shut my door so I don't get interruptions here, so excuse me for that. Oh, actually, I have uh, somebody shutting a door for me right now, so that's great. Um, Perfect. Maybe we can pull up our agenda and let people know what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So the agenda is actually pretty straightforward. Obviously, we're talking about NDI. Um, and first, we're just going to talk about NDI in general. What is NDI? What's the difference between NDI and NDI HX for those who have heard those those uh, two terms. And then we're going to look at the application. So why would you want to use NDI? What are some of those benefits? Um, you know, why, why is there so much buzz around NDI? We'll look a little bit about the ecosystem around NDI. And then we'll get into how to do it with, with specifically with Perl 2. So how to, how to make use of Perl 2's capability uh, to use NDI. And then of course, like always, we'll have lots of time at the end to get around to any of the questions that you put in the question section. So do, do post lots of questions and we'll, we'll get to them mostly at the end. There's a chance we'll take one or two as we go if it happens to pertain to the slide that we're on. But we'll definitely get to, to the rest of the questions at the end of the at the end of the webinar. That's great. Okay. So maybe we'll we'll start right kind of at the fundamental question, what is NDI? Um, and, you know, why does anybody care? Uh, so a short little history, um, NDI was created by New Tech um, and it was made to be an open protocol um, so that it's not open source, but they've invited many, many people to join in and become uh, participants in the NDI ecosystem. So it's a fairly large ecosystem. Um, it's a low latency protocol. So the idea is uh, to be able to move video around on your traditional ethernet network as quickly as you would have been able to move it around on an SDI based dedicated video network in the past. So it's really meant to replace that infrastructure that was very SDI oriented um, with big SDI routers and all kinds of uh, coax cable that's dedicated. This is meant to, to have a simpler way of moving that same video with low latency and high quality over those, those same networks, or sorry, over your, your ethernet network. And then uh, one of the nice things is because you're then on a large switch network, uh, that is really becomes the bound to how many of these sources you can have. So if you've got a really good robust network, you can have many, many of the NDI sources on the network and they're very easy to find. We'll talk about the discovery um, part of that. Um, and for the more advanced users, there is the ability to, to choose between unicast and multicast. And I'm not sure we'll get into a lot of that unless people have specific questions. Um, but it is built to go on to a gigabit ethernet network. Um, and that's, that's really what it's designed for. 
Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an exciting time for NDI because we're at that sweet spot where it's a technology that's being, uh, there's a lot of people here today because obviously they're curious about it, but it's not everywhere yet. So it'll be interesting to see how it develops if we do see a world where people no longer put in SDI infrastructure and instead just count entirely on NDI. So uh, I don't know how far away from that we are. Uh, I've talked to people who have said they tried it and it didn't work for them. And I've talked to other people who said they tried it and they're getting ready to replace all of their infrastructure. So uh, it's going to be an exciting couple of years to see the, how this gets adopted. Yeah, and there are a few kind of competing protocols as well. So if you look just at the AV over IP uh, umbrella of products, mm -hmm. there, there are like the SDV over E is another option. Um, it requires 10 gigabit Ethernet instead of gigabit Ethernet. Um, you know, some of the some of the other vendors have their own. I know Crestron's got their NBX. And so mm -hmm. there, there are some competing protocols out there too that you can choose from. But certainly NDI is gaining a lot of, acceptance in the market and we're starting to see certainly more and more of our customers contacting us around NDI and using NDI. Um, so we've had lots of people telling us that they've been using it and what they've been using it for and we're going to cover some of those um, as we go forward. But certainly it's at the beginning. Uh, it hasn't completely taken off and as you said it, it takes a bit to, to get mm -hmm. familiar enough with it and trust it to be able to take out that SDI network and completely replace that. But certainly we're seeing lots of people thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. And okay. maybe we'll touch on the ecosystem a little bit because obviously with any new protocol, the adoption is really dependent on, um, you know, how many devices are out there that support it and, and how well do they support it? How interoperable are they? Um, and so I can say new tech's done a really good job of bringing in a wide range of different devices, um, whether that's, you know, software like, like Microsoft Skype or the Azure platform in general, you know, hardware encoders like our Perl 2, dedicated NDI PTZ cameras, software encoding like vMix or OBS. So there's, there's a very wide range of of products um, across the ecosystem. So whether they are like just converters, whether they're cameras, whether it's software apps that you're running either on your phone or on your laptop, they've really done a good job of inviting many, many people into that ecosystem and enticing them to build NDI into their products. For sure, and the interoperability, uh, I never say that word properly, forgive me. Uh, it, it seems really great for this platform too, in that once I know I get onto the LAN with my NDI signal, uh, for the most part, it seems like it's gonna work in any of these applications. Uh, we've, we've seen a few little glitches here and there with more of a niche use cases around transparency and other things like that. But once you get your NDI signal up into your, uh, onto your LAN, uh, all of these great tools from, from Skype, and we've talked about Teams wanting to support it, and Zoom has talked about wanting to support it, to our hardware encoders and all these software, they seem to be able to ingest it with no trouble at all. So uh, it seems pretty yeah. simple. Yeah, the way that New Tech kind of designed it and controls it um, allows for a very high degree of interoperability. So rather than publishing a specification and having people have all their different implementations or creating it as an open source project where people go and make modifications. Instead, they're actually owning the code base and they provide that to you to build into your product. Um, so in that way, it maybe slows down the development a little bit than compared with something that's completely open source. But the advantage is that that interoperability is very high because in the end, aside from a few tweaks and you know the way that people are building it into their products, the core technology is all coming from new tech. And as that core technology advances, they're the ones making the changes. So it's really incumbent upon them to do a good job of interoperability, but it takes the burden off of vendors like us to, to test with everybody onto the planet because we're really all using pretty much the same code base in different forms that, that new tech provides. So the interoperability is really great. That's one thing they've done extremely well uh, with mm -hmm. NDI. And our experience has been just that. We've tested with a range of different cameras, pieces of software, encoders, all of that stuff. And we found it to be you know, very easy to interrupt. You mentioned there are a couple little things with alpha channels and little 
uh, subtle things that that sometimes might catch you up, but in general, it it's it's quite good and and yeah. quite quick to mm -hmm. deploy and test. So um, that, so. Uh, if you are watching us on Crowdcast, you might notice that there's a little polls section there. And our first poll has gone up uh, asking you about what industry you're in. Uh, and it's kind of fun for us to see if, if you answer that question in that poll, we'll find out uh, who, what the majority of the people are from, and then we can try to speak to your use case more than the other one. So uh, check in periodically for these polls. And I see lots of nice chat going on to, here too, people uh, talking about Dante Audio as well, which now has a video platform or video over IP solution. And yep. so uh, same person, another person posted a question, is NDI uh, synonymous to Dante for audio? And I think it's a pretty good uh, vector to compare those two. Uh, so, you know, we could have yeah. done this podcast about, or sorry, could have done this webinar about Dante audio and a lot of the same slides and technology that we're going to talk about would, would make sense, right? Yeah, certainly a lot of the benefits are very similar as we look at, you know, whether it's Dante or Crestron's NBX or mm -hmm. NDI getting those those uh, services whether it's audio or video off of dedicated networks and dedicated switches dedicated cabling and moving them onto a, a generic kind of ip network yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it gives all the same benefits whether we're talking about you know dante audio or we're talking about ndi for video um really having that network ability and discoverability and that's the other thing that dante does very well um we won't delve too deeply into Dante here, but Dante also has really good discovery so that when you're on the network, finding where those sources are and being able to connect to them is, is pretty easy and simple. Um, so NDI does a, a pretty good job of that as well. Um, mm -hmm. I would say one of the things that I've seen uh, a couple people get tripped up on when looking at NDI is there are kind of two flavors of it. And it started as just... Um, NDI, so they just called it NDI, and that includes a codec uh, and the networking kind of structure around that codec to put it on on an IP network. Um, and then later they introduced NDI HX, and really they are uh, very similar in most ways, uh, but there are a couple of key differences. Um, the main one is the codec, so it's it's using the HX version is using the H.264 compression uh, video codec, which is extremely popular. It's what we have in our in our Perl 2 and our Perl Mini. So it's an extremely popular codec. Um, but one of the disadvantages of that codec is that it is actually compressing the signal quite a lot. And when NDI started, its whole reason to be or, or the application it was trying to solve was to replace kind of uncompressed SDI signals that are being routed around in a studio environment. Um, so they didn't want a ton of compression because they want to keep the quality of that signal extremely high. Um, but what they did find was if they allowed both to be part of the specification to have, I'll call it regular NDI or pure NDI and NDI HX, having that mix made the ecosystem that much larger. So there were many more devices that already had H.264 capability that could then easily wrap that into NDI and become part of that NDI ecosystem. It may not have exactly the same performance in terms of latency and certainly not the same performance in terms of video quality because it is compressing that video much more. Um, but from the discovery point of view and the ability to switch it across the network and all of that stuff, it works uh, exactly the same. So it really did help to expand the ecosystem and make sure that devices, which maybe would never have had the ability to build in the NDI native codec, um, could kind of join the party and become part of that ecosystem. So it's been, it's been a good addition to the to the NDI world, and it's brought a lot more uh, vendors into the ecosystem and brought them in a lot more quickly because they could take existing products that already have capability for H.264 encoding and then just add the kind of network layer if you want around all of that to get it onto the IP network. So you do need to be a little careful. People just refer to it as NDI in general and, and that's fine. Um, but when you're actually implementing, you're going to want to be a little more specific as to what it is you're connecting. Um, and the biggest kind of thing to watch out for there is the bandwidth usage. So. As I mentioned, the H.264 compiler is going to compress considerably more 
than the native NDI uh, compression. So 125 megabits is generally what you would see for a native NDI compressed stream. And that's meant to be, you know, compressed so that it can fit nicely on a gigabit ethernet network and be switched around, but not really heavily compressed so that you keep that quality as high as possible in kind of your production environment. Um, the HX version that uses H.264 is more in the 8 to 20 megabit range. So quite a bit more compression. You got like another 10 times kind of compression going on. And that's nice if you're in a lower kind of bandwidth scenario. Um, but otherwise, you just need to be sure that when you're setting up your network, if you've got, call it native NDI versus HX NDI, they're going to have different requirements for that bandwidth. Um, and there are some latency trade-offs there as well. Mm -hmm. But even that 8 to 20 megabytes per second, uh, we talk about that being a, a lower quality uh, H.264 compression, but uh, you and I are both streaming today at about four megabytes, right? So uh, <laughs> it's still going to be outstanding quality, just not quite, you know, ProRes quality that you might know, know or raw recording kind of quality. So. Exactly. Yeah. All of the content that people are used to consuming, whether, you know, on OTT systems, whether it's... Um, mm -hmm you know, Netflix or YouTube or any of that, all of that would have been H.264 encoded. So it's not to say that you can't get great quality out of an H.264 encoder. It's just traditionally in the production environment, this video was completely uncompressed when it was all just routed as SDI dedicated cabling. Um, and so they wanted something that was a little closer to that for the pre-production or the production environment before you get to the distribution where then you need to, you know, you really need to have a reasonable signal that you can send out to users over Netflix or, or whatever. So then you need to be in the, you know, small number of megabits range, not in the hundreds yeah, of right. megabits. Um, mm -hmm. So, but you're right. Uh, people will look at the quality of that 20 megabit signal and it's fantastic. It's great. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's not quite 125 meg but it certainly is a very good quality signal. Um, so you shouldn't necessarily shy away from HX for that reason. It can be used uh, very well and people won't, you know, be easily yeah. uh, picking out I, which signals are which on, on your production. Yeah, I guess the one thing to watch out for is that some certain applications or certain equipment will only send or receive one or the, one or the other or both. So you may end up having a mismatch where you have uh, something that's encoding a signal for NDI HX, but your where you're trying to decode that or the other end of the LAN or the software you're trying to use, it might not support that. So just double check that it's got, that everything is, yep. says NDI HX, if that's the way you're going to go on things. Uh, so yep. it's small consideration, but uh, you wouldn't want to get caught. Exactly. Yeah. It's just one of those things to double check when you're putting everything together mm -hmm. to make sure that it's all compatible and that you're going to have enough bandwidth uh, for whichever codec you're actually using. Yeah, right. Um, so maybe we can spend a little bit of time and dig into the benefits. Um, you know, NDI has a number of benefits we talked about. You know, they're not necessarily all unique to, to NDI. Mm -hmm. They're, they're in generally uh, available on, on different a, AV over IP solutions. But, but these benefits are, are pretty big for people, especially in the studio environment that are used to having all these SDI cables and big SDI routers. Um, so we can walk through a few of these benefits and talk about why you want to go NDI, why you want to move away. Um, and I would say the, the first is that you want to be able to get all of your video switching onto your IP network. That gives you the most flexibility um, and probably bang for the buck when you look at the cost of say an SDI switch or router versus an ethernet switch or router or an IP router. Um, you just get better kind of economies of scale when you're dealing with the IP infrastructure. So, so building out that network or even putting your video on top of your existing network saves you from having to kind of outlay for dedicated cabling of SDI and dedicated routers and switches that which can also be very expensive. Um, so mm -hmm. definitely you, you cost just, is a big one. For sure. And you go from basically a one-to-one -one relationship between your 
uh, you know, camera and your switcher to a one to many, where as soon as you get it onto that network, you can send that camera feed anywhere you like, because you might have a, a monitoring set up in one room or a, an OB truck set up somewhere else. And you, you, there's a lot of places you might want to send that video signal and using NDI, you can send and receive it wherever you want, as opposed to a cabling system, which was, would be a infinitely more yeah, complex and, to set up. Yeah, that's exactly right. Monitoring is a huge um, kind of cost in a traditional kind of wired or SDI network of all the places you may need to monitor that signal and you're dropping mm -hmm. that off on all these SDI ports. Certainly, uh, it's much easier and, and much less expensive to do that on an IP infrastructure. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. even being able to, to find where those signals are. We'll talk about the discovery part of NDI, but it makes it fairly easy to find those signals and name those signals something meaningful rather than worrying about port numbers on switches and all this kind of stuff yeah, that, that yeah. you really had to look at in the past when you were wiring everything through an SDI router. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like most of these applications would refer to a bigger install, not just a small studio environment. Like you and I are in our houses today, but if we were in a studio here, uh, there wouldn't be a great as much, nearly as much benefit to me to set up for NDI because cable management is not an issue in a small space. But uh, for some place where I'm going from room to room or f like through really big rooms or uh, that's, I guess, where the real benefit kicks in. Yeah, exactly. Or or as you mentioned, when you're trying to fan that signal out to many places, right, all right. of that gets much easier in, a, in an IP network. But certainly, yeah, here at home, it's much simpler for me just to take an SDI cable out of my camera and directly into the back of Pearl and I've got one dedicated link, it's isolated, there's nothing on the network that could disturb it, it's much simpler. But it doesn't scale very nicely when you've got lots of cameras or lots of places that that signal needs to be either monitored or distributed to. And so it really is for the bigger installations. Um, but it also helps if you're going into temporary installations like at a conference or something and you're setting up a, a large stage um, not having to run SDI cables for your cameras and then Ethernet cables for your control and your laptops mm -hmm. and everything to just be able to run one network just saves a lot of the cabling and the hassle. And in many cases, um, you can just use the venues network um, and that will always be there. Whereas going into a venue and saying, I need it, you know, a dedicated six, eight ports on an SDI switch. You're never going to find that inside of a large hotel or that kind of <laughs> right. thing. But they always, they always have an Ethernet network. Um, it can be expensive, yes. but it's always there and you're able to, to go and say, I need these ports on my Ethernet network. And then you can place whatever you need on there. And NDI is, is uh, great to be able to say, I've got a camera way in this room and I want, it in, I want the signal to go to the overflow room or whatever it is. It's just very easy to route it, very easy to deploy it on cables mm -hmm. that already exist in the infrastructure versus trying to drag your own cables in mm -hmm. and set up. A video network in a, in a space that is not kind of permanent that's exactly that's another yeah. challenge yeah as long as you don't mind paying the thirty seven thousand dollars they're going to charge you for access to the hotel <laughs> network you're they good can be go. very expensive yes uh, depending how how private you need that that network to be if it's if it's needed to be dedicated to you you will pay for it um, yeah but they, it's could, not... they could turn to benefit from this ndi technology uh, it'll make Abs their network absolutely. that much more valuable um, yeah, it saves a lot of running around with, with mm -hmm. long cables and all this kind of stuff, right? When you can just plug into the closest uh, Ethernet port and be able to pick off that signal anywhere else in the hotel. It certainly makes uh, all the networking much, much simpler. Yeah. Um, we mentioned you can remotely monitor multiple NDI feeds. So there's lots of software out there, some of it provided by NewTek even, that you can load onto your laptop and just monitor many feeds so if you want if you're at a venue where there's lots of uh you know different sessions going on like at a conference or that kind of thing it's very easy to have a central place where you can monitor everything that's going on very easily without running extra cables they're all going over the network and you can turn those monitors on and off to save bandwidth if you need to so it's very easy to control um, and it frees up hdmi ports on your production gear so if you are using something like a large switcher uh, or something like Pearl, there are only a finite number of physical ports on the box. And uh, so NDI offers a way to kind of expand that and say, okay, mm -hmm. if I've used mm -hmm. up my two HDMI ports or my two SDI ports, yet I have a third camera that I really need to bring in, 
using a converter or getting a camera that natively supports NDI gives you a very easy way just to bring that extra source in with very little kind of cost in terms of ports. Um, That's right. And there's little, and then, there's little cost for the software too. Like all of the software that we mentioned here, Adobe, uh, Creative Cloud, OBS, VLC, you know, Adobe's not free, but the, 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 the NDI aspect of the software is always free yeah. as far as I can tell. Yeah, so many it, of the tools no are free. There's no real added I, overhead. Yeah, I think some of them there is a cost for some of the tools that and that new tech provides, but it's very reasonable, very yeah, reasonable. Yeah. Like we're mm-hmm. talking hundred dollars kind of thing. Sure. It's, uh, mm-hmm. So they've done a very good job to make it as accessible as possible because they don't want that to be a hurdle for adoption, right? They want people yeah. to be able to afford to deploy it. So they've made it as affordable as possible. They've done a great job there. There are mm-hmm. many free plugins and tools that you can pick up and many of the free software like OBS, VLC, have already incorporated NDI into that um, software so that that comes for free. So if you're using VLC to monitor a bunch of things, that's easily done. If you want OBS to generate an NDI signal across your network, that can be done. So there are definitely options all the way from free to quite affordable um, that that allow you to deploy this pretty easily. Um, So it's definitely easier on the pocketbook than the SDI alternatives. Um, and to some degree it's, it's easier to manage and easier to deploy. And I think that's one of the big, um, benefits of, of the NDI infrastructure is it's not just the connectivity. It's not just getting the signal off of the SDI cable and onto an ethernet cable, um, but also providing the discovery. Uh, and this allows you to name ports on the network. So if I were to put a camera that supports NDI on the network, I could name it Dave's production camera and I could name yours George's camera or I could name it my outside driveway camera, whatever it is pointing at. Um, And across that network, I would be able to discover those sources. So when someone needs to monitor that signal or pick that signal up in a production system, they're not needing to know IP addresses or port numbers or any of these kind of convoluted networking uh, things. They just can filter literally by name across the network. And they even have the capability to group into different groups, different discovery groups, so that if you're in a very large network, you're not picking up hundreds of cameras and having to sift through too many names. You can group them into logical groups and then you can search within a group and say, hey, I'm looking for a camera that has George's name in it and it'll pop up the three ones that have George in the name or whatever. Um, so we have that feature exposed on Perl, obviously. So when you are when you are connecting um, a source rather than plugging it directly into the back, you would do with an HDMI or an SDI, you're going and adding this NDI connection and then when it asks you which connection, you know, which source are you trying to monitor or bring into the Perl? Um, it'll bring up a list of the available sources on the network within that group. And then you just select it and that's all you need to know. So the discovery makes it uh, very easy to deploy and gets you away from the idea of, you know, port numbers on a router or on an SDI switch. You don't need to know any of that. You don't need to know the IP addresses, even though it is fundamentally on an IP network. There's a discovery layer across across the top of that IP network that obscures all of that for you or abstracts that away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely much simpler than any other network source like an RTSP source, which is really just a string of numbers that don't have any <laughs> meaning. So to be able to give it a name to your, to your signals, uh, it's simple but pretty powerful uh, and will save you from making any mistakes. Um, yeah, and the, the fact that they went to the bother to add the groups right out of the beginning um, tells you that that they are targeting this technology for large studios even that would have many, many cameras or many, many NDI sources. So they, right from the beginning, um, they kind of understood that that environment's going to exist and you don't want a list of a hundred sources to, to pile through to find what you're looking for. So they did, I, I would say Newtick did a really great job of knowing what was the problem they were trying to tackle and making sure all the little pieces were there uh, to make it usable for, for the users. All right. So just a reminder to everybody who's watching, uh, put your questions in the ask a question field 
in the Crowdcast interface here. I see lots of questions in the chat, which is great, and you're gonna get other people answering them also, but uh, if you wanna make sure that we get to it, make sure it goes into that ask a question thing. Uh, we'll try and pick through both the chat and the questions, but uh, uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you want, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So we'll go here to probably before three o'clock uh, Eastern time, and then we'll turn it over to, and, and run through a whole bunch of questions. Uh, there's also some polls going up now. So there's one that's gone up uh, earlier about what kind of industry you're in. And now there's another um, poll that's gone up. Has it, have you ever live streamed or recorded? Have you ever streamed or recorded a live event? It looks like overwhelmingly uh, most people here who are watching have done that. Excellent. And what's also interesting, Dave, is, is that uh, most people are responding as uh, being in the arts and entertainment business. So oh, great. Uh, which is great. We often uh, do these webinars and we'll get lots of people from the live event business and I suppose you, you could you could that's what you could call this here as, as well uh, so we'll make sure we try to talk to uh, that use case in particular yeah. Uh, so yeah keep that chat going there's lots of great questions here which is uh, great to see yeah. okay so then we get into the devices and software right Dave when we could talk about basically what can you do with uh, an NDI signal Exactly. Yeah. So we'll take a little bit closer look at what is in the ecosystem. So what do you have to choose from once you decide, okay, I want to move, I want to employ uh, NDI and get away from, you know, my HDMI and SDI connections. There are thankfully a lot of options there. Um, so there are IP cameras. Um, so if you look across now, they, they tend to be more of the PTZ style cameras. You don't see a lot of, um, you know, broadcast production cameras um, yet, but those are coming. But we do see a lot of the PTZ kind of style cameras uh, already having NDI built in, and those tend to be mostly NDI HX. Um, but I've seen a few that are that are NDI, and I think that list will grow. Um, mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot of software, as we mentioned earlier. Um, you know, OBS, Skype. New Blue FX, which is a titling software that that we actually use here to produce our events, um, VLC, and the Adobe Creative Cloud um, has a plugin that allows uh, generation and reception of NDI. Um, so there's there's quite a large sort of range of devices and and software out there to choose from when you're looking to kind of build that that ecosystem, and we've got kind of a for those who might find all those choices a little overwhelming, we do have a couple tips here just to kind of break it down a little bit. Um, we generally refer to NDI converters as something that will take in, say, an SDI signal or an HDMI signal, and it will convert it to NDI for you. So if, for instance, you had a camera at the back of a large venue uh, and you wanted, instead of running, uh, a long SDI cable or something back to your production desk, you could pop on one of these little converters and then find a network jack close by, possibly even Wi-Fi, although I don't recommend running uh, NDI over Wi-Fi. You really want it on the, on the wired network if you can. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to run that dedicated cable from that SDI. And, and when we looked, you know, in the past, people often need to choose between, can I get away with, HDMI, can I get away with SDI, which do I need for my application? Generally, people were choosing SDI if there was a long distance to travel because HDMI <laughs> is, is quite limited in, in the reach. Um, once you go to the network on, on NDI, again, reach is not an issue. You can go through multiple hops, multiple switches, and you know those switches can propagate signals over very long Ethernet uh, cables, RJ. 45 connectors into your cat six or cat five cable. So that can be run a long way. So the little NDI converters are handy little ones to, to take the gear that isn't natively NDI and turn it into something that can be part of the NDI ecosystem. Um, there's software called the NDI studio monitor, um, which is used to cast video streams across the land. So this is software that can just run say in a windows environment on your laptop and signals that you have there or windows that you have there, you can turn them into NDI signals and cast them or stream them across the network to a production desk or, or even to view them somewhere else or monitor them. Um, similarly, they have what they call virtual kind of NDI input. So 
the idea here is if you're receiving something that's NDI, but where you need to use it or monitor it doesn't support NDI, then there is the way to convert that effectively to a virtual camera or a webcam so that software that you're running on that same system could access that camera and to that software it appears not as an NDI source but as a webcam or a virtual source. So that might be the case, say you were running a Zoom client and you wanted to bring in an NDI source, um, you could convert that NDI source, it's, it's received on your laptop over the network, you could convert it to a virtual camera and then feed it into Zoom from there because as of yet, Zoom does not natively support NDI, so, but there are tools to kind of glue those things together if you need to. And then of course the easiest one probably of all is, is just running the new tech NDI on, on your phone and being able to generate a signal directly from there. So typically that's a camera signal, but in theory it can be anything that you want to stream from your phone to get a signal across the NDI network. So there's, there's lots of choices, um, but they all have a purpose, right? So there's converters to get old gear onto the network. There's virtual inputs to get signals on the network into gear that doesn't directly support it. Um, and then there's, you know, the studio monitor and the, and the cell phone, or cell phone app to be able to, to basically take what you have and put it onto the network as an NDI signal. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's, uh, Mateo was pointing out here in the chat that there's another uh, NDI capture tool from NewTek where you can use it as a screen casting app from your iOS device. So I can share my screen uh, over NDI as well, not just the camera. Not uh, just the camera. camera. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, there's gonna be more and more of these tools coming out uh, and they're all seem to be pretty easy to use. Um, Paul Billings is pointing out that uh, Bird Dog makes some really compelling NDI cameras and hardware for Capture 2. And uh, I, I agree with you there. They're pretty innovative and seem to be a little bit ahead of the curve on most people on the NDI front. Uh, we, we were talking to them last week about their whole NDI cloud infrastructure because, uh, I mean, most of you watching realize now we're talking about NDI, which is a local area network uh, <clears throat> tool. So it's going to help you move your, your video sources and cameras around a local network, but it doesn't have anything to do with the cloud. So you can't send that up to the cloud. But there are people like Bird Dog investing in technology that allows you to then take that network stream and send it uh, around the world to someone else. So that's right. far from the primary use case for NDI. Uh, it's really an extension of it, but uh, those capabilities are starting to build up as well. Yeah, I think there was another company, Sienna something, um, yeah, not the that telecom about. Sienna, but yeah. S-I-E-N-N-A early mm -hmm. on that was doing the same kind of thing. They wanted to be able to take NDI over a large distance network. So there are definitely people, um, you know, kind of moving beyond, as you said, the, the prime use case, which is inside the building, inside the production center to be able to say, can I use that same technology across a larger distance or a larger mm -hmm. network? Mm -hmm. And it is possible. Um, there are, again, other options when you want to do that. SRT is another option. There's, there's other ways to do that. But certainly if you've got an NDI infrastructure on one end and the other, and you're just trying to get across the middle, across a larger distance, then taking NDI over the wide area might make the most sense. So yeah, yeah. You can see Definitely. how it's the future. I mean, once you get it onto your network, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. You can compress it, you can transcode it, you can do all these things to it and, and manipulate it in a way that you could never really do uh, with just using traditional uh, equipment. So yeah. the potential is pretty incredible. Yep. So I think in, in general, um, when we talk, uh, you know, this, this webinar is specifically about NDI, but I think what we've seen in the last while in AV over IP is really starting to dominate um, kind of the equipment space and certainly the service space. So people are really starting to deploy this stuff. And I would say Dante was probably one of the first when, when it came to audio, they were the first one to get such a large ecosystem of, of mixers and USB interfaces and all kinds of stuff that would be able to, um, that would be able to get onto the Dante network and easily exchange um, that audio, connect it very easily, find it very easily. So they, they set a great example and there is Dante video as well coming as, as part of their ecosystem. But whether it's, whether it's Dante or whether it's SDV over E or whether it's NDI, pretty much all of these, uh, these benefits of having very good quality 
easily switched, very easily discoverable um, and cost effective. That's, that's really common to all of them and, and it's what's driving all of them. So whether it's NDI specifically or it's a mixture of NDI with other AV over IP protocols, we really see the future of production moving much, much more to, to the AV over IP infrastructure. And only when you're connecting you know, a camera in a very local scenario would you, would you kind of resort back to your SDI cables and things. I think very soon things are going to be just natively, I don't need an HDMI port on my camera. I don't need an SDI port on my camera. I just need my IP port that runs NDI and I can connect into my network and then take it from there. So we're not quite there yet, but I think in the future, we'll start to see devices that only have um, kind of an IP port on them. You'll just see that RJ45 jack on the back and it's a cat five or six cable you pop in there mm -hmm. and there won't be an SDI port and people probably won't miss it uh, once we get well into this kind of AV over IP world. So there's another um, poll that's gone up. Uh, if you're watching on Crowdcast, you'll see these polls at the bottom of your screen. Um, this one came up a little while ago, which is uh, how will you use NDI? So come in here and vote if you haven't and let us know how you're thinking about using it. it seems like people, the most common answer is the all of the above, which means people want to use uh, NDI for uh, multiple cameras, effects, room monitors, and uh, stream conferencing software. So people, it looks like they're excited just in general about all the things you might be able to do with NDI. So that's great. Yeah, so let's let's dig into those a little bit. I, I think we've mentioned some of those, but we've got a couple diagrams we can go through that will just help us to, to picture what we're talking about. Um, so in this case, this is the most, this is the first thing I think of when, when someone mentions that they want to use NDI, the, 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 the most obvious one to me is cameras connected across the LAN going either to a monitoring station or to some production equipment like a switch or both, um, both actually, or both right? at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and as we talked about it, it, it gets you away from cable length issues and, and running a dedicated network and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. whether you're in a fixed install where you're mounting those cameras permanently or whether you're setting up in a kind of temporary space, um, if there's already, uh, you know, an IP network in that venue, in that space, it certainly makes sense to make use of it and not have to run dedicated cables from your cameras to your monitors to your production gear yeah, to be able yeah. to just pop it on the LAN and use that infrastructure to mm -hmm. distribute it every, everywhere you need it. So that to me is the most kind of basic and easy one. Um, George, you mentioned graphics. Uh, yeah, this next, this next one is one we're doing right now, right here. So when you see these little green bars come up across the screen that say, you know, answer the poll or the ones that say our names on them. Those are done exactly using this kind of application where we have a production computer running a software called New Blue Effects. And New Blue Effects is a, does titling and lower thirds and all kinds of great graphics uh, for productions. And we run all of our graphics on that computer and then we push it over NDI to our Perl system. And it allows us, in our case, to get a free input in a sense because we have a lot of cameras and well, we used to have a lot of physical cameras plugged into our Perl systems. So NDI enables us to free up a port, um, but it also gives us uh, the support for transparency. So there, there, as far as I know, there's no way for uh, to send a signal that supports transparency over an SDI cable or an HDMI cable. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but I don't know of any. Um, uh yeah, there weren't any that go over a single cable. I think there were some keying systems that would then you plug your signal in and it would oh okay it would okay. find the key either chroma key or luma key, but then it would provide both the key and the fill over yeah two individual SDI cables. So you're you're using two ports to get to get that that keyed effect. Whereas here, you know, the alpha channel is just part of NDI. Yeah, that's pretty special. There's like I've been doing video uh, most of my professional life. And the applications that support alpha are, have been few and far between. Uh, so the fact that NDI supports alpha is pretty powerful for things like titling software. So it's been a great fit for us. Absolutely. Yeah, and the next one um, we have is kind of closely related, and that's the media playback. Yeah, yeah, it really, it's kind of the same thing, uh, but you don't need any kind of special software. You can just play a... Uh, 
media on your computer and then use an NDI application to push that out to a production uh, encoder like Perl or anywhere else you want. Exactly. Yeah. And almost anywhere where people are taking the time to add things like titles and other things, often they're doing this as well, right? They've got some mm -hmm. kind of media that they want to insert at some point into their production, whether it's pre-roll, post-roll, or something in the middle of the production. Um, it's handy, again, not to have to burn yet another port on your on your Perl or on your production switcher. Um, so you can have one device doing your media insertion, another device doing your titling, and they're both using the same, quote, physical port, which is your Ethernet port on the back of your production switcher. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's great that you can have dedicated machines and not be piling up all these cabling and using up all your ports. The other one, the next one is kind of interesting in that it's, it's pearl to pearl. Um, and there's a, I, I guess the one thing we haven't really talked about yet, we'll get into more of the details of using Perl with NDI, um, but we do have the ability to both send NDI and receive NDI in the Perl, uh, in the Perl 2. And that gives us this ability to send an NDI signal from one Perl to the next. And there's a few scenarios where this could be very handy. Um, one could be if you've got kind of a smaller production studio, let's say you're doing most of your production, you're switching in that one Perl or that, that one element, but maybe some of the more kind of advanced things like the titling or maybe there's ad insertion or there's other things going on in the production downstream, um, you could be sending an NDI signal so that it goes from one production system to the next so that you can effectively just break your production into multiple pieces. And because the NDI, if you're not using the HX, if you're using the, the native NDI, it's really not compressing the signal very much. So going from one box to the next and to the next in a production flow is feasible um, because you're not compressing that signal very right. very hard each time you go from one box to the next. So it does allow you much like we, we would see in the old SDI infrastructure where a signal as it goes through the kind of production chain would go SDI from, from kind of site to site or, or box to box. You can do the same thing um, with Perl and with NDI. So sometimes it's directly to a monitor or it's coming from a source like we just showed. In this case, it's production system to production system. And I think that that's one of the, the values that that really helps when you're in a larger production and it might be broken across multiple pieces and you really want to be able to chain those together easily and be able to reconfigure the chain so that it's not a dedicated cable one box to the next. It's something that you could rearrange very easily, you know, from one hour to the next in a, in a broadcast environment or a studio environment where you're rearranging things and changing mm -hmm. the workflow as you go. Right. Uh, this next example, I kind of like Dave, because uh, what we're showing is uh, how to do overflow rooms using NDI converters. And so the use case would be you have a switcher like Perl operating and you want to show the program, let's say in the lobby of your conference center. Uh, and you could do that over NDI. If you have an NDI converter that could convert that signal into something like HDMI for your, your monitor that's in that space. But what this is really illustrating is that you can completely mix and match traditional infrastructure like SDI cabling and monitors and HDMI cables with an NDI ecosystem. So it's not like you have to go you don't have to convert your whole system over in one day. You can still have these outlier pieces on your system like a monitor or another camera that doesn't support NDI and use converters to convert those signals uh, into NDI or vice versa. Um, they're not cheap. I don't know how much uh, an NDI converter is off the top of my head. I should have looked that up beforehand, but it was more than a few hundred dollars when I last checked. Uh, inevitably, that price will drop because these things always go down in price, but uh, it is yeah. nice to know that you can build this hybrid system if you need to. Yeah, and those, those converters are just super handy things to kind of have in your AV kit if you're if you're doing any of these kind of setup and tear down or site to site kind of AV jobs. Um, having a couple of these small converters, as you said, allows you to just wheel in a traditional TV monitor if you need that or a traditional camera if you want to add another one. So having converters that can go back and forth is really important 
to make sure that it's easy to deploy, as you said, you don't have to switch everything from SDI or HDMI over to NDI all at once. You can switch out the elements that make sense now, use converters for the others, and then gradually, you know, move those converters out or, or just have those converters on hand for when you run across that extra element that you didn't anticipate you would need and you have older technology that's not NDI capable. It's very easy, just plug one of these in and off you go. So it, I, I, I'll say again, and NewTek did a really great job of making sure that the ecosystem was quite complete. And there's a number of vendors, um, you know, someone mentioned Bird Dog earlier, NewTek's got their Spark series, and there are a few others, certainly many others actually out in the market. Um, so it's it's fairly easy to come by these these NDI converters. As you mentioned, they're not super inexpensive, but they are very easy to find um, mm -hmm. and they interop extremely well. So you don't have to worry about, you know, does this one work? Does that one work? They're all quite good. Um, and I guess last but not least, um, remote guests and video conferencing. So maybe you can talk through this one a little bit. Sure, so we've experimented with this, uh, I'd say a fair bit, uh, trying to do uh, what we're doing here today, in fact. So it used to be that we would have our studio set up and we would be in that studio um, and we would wanna bring in a remote guest. So you can bring in a remote guest over Skype using NDI. Skype is the only conferencing tool right now that I know of that supports NDI uh, and others have promised support for it. So Teams has mentioned it, uh, Zoom has mentioned it, but we don't know how long these things are gonna take to, uh, to actually get built. But right now, if you have a Skype feed running on one computer, you can send uh, that feed directly over the network to an encoder like Perl. And the, the advantage is, is you get this nice ISO of any guest in that Skype call. So as opposed to now where you have to sort of, like what we do sometimes is we'll crop uh, a conferencing call to try to get rid of the name and the other things. And maybe it's a small window on your screen. Uh, when you use NDI for that, you could just get a nice clear signal uh, of the, the participants and it could be more than one participant. So it's a really, way to e really easy way to bring in uh, conferencing participants into uh, a broadcast system. Uh, uh, using any kind of encoder system. So uh, it's, I'm looking forward to more tools like this being supporting this because it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's great. And as you mentioned, Skype supports it already. Uh, Zoom, not quite yet. Um, they may be working on that. I don't know. Uh, but there are also those new tech tools that we talked about earlier where you could convert an NDI signal um, coming into something and convert it for Zoom or vice versa. You could take a signal that Zoom is generating and capture that, take that window and basically stream that out using uh, the scan converter tool or some of the other tools from Skype or from yeah. New Tech, sorry. So I think for sure we'll see more and more conferencing applications be able to su support NDI natively. Um, but in the meantime, if you're fairly handy with putting multiple pieces together and piling stuff up, it is possible um, to get even more of the existing conferencing software that isn't natively supporting NDI. It is possible with some of the tools in the ecosystem to get that functioning as well. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a very handy way just to quickly bring in a guest in a way that's very easy for them. So there's a couple of comments here in the chat. I noticed people asking for another webinar like this on Perl on its own. And uh, we do those pretty regularly. So just check our webinars page. And uh, I don't know if we have one currently scheduled for the next couple of weeks, but you can rewatch one of the ones we've done in the past, which are just general entry. This is what a Perl is and what a Perl system does. Uh, and we'll be doing more in the future. So I guarantee you there. Uh, another question I wanna answer is that uh, in regards to NDI on Perl, we don't have a lot to show because it's so very straightforward. I mean, you do the discovery tool and you see what kind of sources are on your network. And then you add, once those sources are in your Perl, they just act like any other input. So it's just as simple as plugging in an HDMI cable in a sense. So we could, we could demonstrate that, but frankly, it's not all that interesting. Uh, and if you understand how a Perl works, uh, you would have no trouble figuring that out at all. So. That's why we, we haven't delved too deeply onto the Perl UI and talking about that the kind of thing. Right. Yeah, we definitely have a, 
lots of people asking for those those pearl demos and and that will definitely i'm sure be part of the next one but as you said it's a very quick and simple piece it doesn't warrant kind of a a webinar all on its own to show how to configure ndi within pearl because that is really quite simple um, but we will try to include that as part of our general here's all kinds of stuff you wanted to know about pearl kind of webinars and we do those from time to time that's right so we've reached the end of our presentation and uh if you've got what you've come for today uh by all means uh, thanks for coming and uh, we hope you've enjoyed everything if you want to stick around here and we're going to go through the questions that have been asked to date or if you have other questions you want to ask put them in the little ask a question thing i can see there's 35 questions in there now so we'll do some uh, rapid fire uh, uh, question answering and try to get through those now so are you ready dave sure okay let's do it uh, you can upvote some of these questions too. So if you're some there that you that you see that you think are the questions you want to know, uh, upvote them and I will get to those first. So the first question is, how secure is NDI infrastructure? I don't know anything about the security of NDI. Dave, can you enlighten our audience? Yeah, so NDI does not have kind of a security layer built into NDI. Um, so really the presumption, because it was mainly designed for kind of an in-studio environment. The idea is that you secure your network um, and then the content on that network is thereby secure. So it's not meant, unlike SRT or some of these other protocols, RTMP that has RTMPS, it's really not meant as a kind of a protocol that you're going to go across public ne networks with and that kind of thing. So inherent in the protocol is not not a real emphasis on security the assumption is that it's running on kind of a a managed dedicated uh network and that you secure the network as opposed to securing the video with the protocol itself mm -hmm. okay uh next question i'll just answer this it's a quick one uh, does Perl mini support ndi and the answer is no Perl mini doesn't uh you can try a Perl 2 system which supports ndi and chroma key and some other things that uh, are really protest processor intensive so uh we found that ndi just wasn't quite uh stable enough on a Perl mini so it's not there now uh here's one for you art dave um are hd base t and ndi the same or compatible <laughs> Uh, no, they are not the same, um, and they are not compatible. I'm trying to think if I know of any systems that support both of those that you could use as a gateway. Okay. There may be some that you could take in an HD base T video signal and then convert to NDI, but I don't know off the top of my head. But they are completely different uh, systems, and they're not related the only way to convert from one to the other would be a box that supports both of those protocols and literally terminating the HD base T and then, you know, putting it on the NDI network and, and vice versa. Right. Um, okay. I'll answer this next one, which is, uh, it's kind of a mouthful, but bear with me. Is it possible to configure a layout with many Skype NDI sources, let's say four guests, and then incorporate four different guests, using the same layout? So the answer is no. You'd have to set up two different layouts uh, because those sources on those layouts are fixed. You can't really have a dynamic layout in, in a Perl system that knows how to switch from one NDI signal to another NDI signal. It's basically a one-to-one -one relationship between our layouts and our inputs. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, do you believe that a new codec in HEVC, H265, will be available soon? Uh, that's from Hugo. I don't know which product line you're talking about, uh, Hugo, but I'm guessing you're talking about the Perl systems. So, Dave, do you want to handle that one? Oh, yeah, well, there's two ways I can interpret that question. I don't know if he's asking, uh, you know, NDI HX supports H264. Will there be an H265 uh, version right. of NDI? I, if that's... that's the question, the answer is I have no idea. Yeah. Um, if if the question is more just when will we see something like HAVC on Pearl on Pearl products or on Epifan products, I would say um, that's something we're actually working on. Uh, so you will see it before too long, um, but it's not on any of our products at the moment. Um, okay, so how can I simplify the talk pack? That's from uh, Rui, 
And again, I don't quite understand the, the context here, uh, the talk back. In regards to NDI, uh, maybe this is no... in a remote guest scenario or um, yeah. there are some, I wouldn't say there's, there's necessarily talk back built into NDI, but it does have um, some, uh, some signaling, some back channel signaling like tally um, mm -hmm. that is built into the protocol. So there are ways to send from a switcher back to a camera, a tally indication and that kind of thing. So there is a little a bit, bit of control. that. Can I send a little bit of control as well? Can I tell yes. that camera to do things? Yeah. Yes, especially if that's a PTZ camera. So you can, you can exercise control. So you can remotely mm -hmm. control a camera over an NDI link and you can send you know, limited back channel kind of tally kind of information back. I don't think there's, unless that device just takes a, you know, a dedicated uh, NDI link that is separate from the one you're receiving. I think that's the only way you could manage a, you know, a voice or video based um, back channel to, to the right. source. Um, but there is some simple tally and there is definitely control for PTZ and, basically any control for a camera. Um, so they do have some of those features built in, but not what I would call a complete back channel. Okay. So here's another sort of security uh, question, Dave. Uh, I'm in a hotel and I have NDI tools. Uh, this question is from Paul Johnson. And he wants to know, can he discover anyone on the network using an NDI source? And do they have, a, is there a password or security protection around that source? As far as I know, there's um, nothing. It's completely open, right? It kind of depends a little bit on the hotel network. Um, I know when I've set up at, at some events inside of a venue, they will give you a restricted portion of the network. So for instance, I was at a, a sure. kind of a, not a trade show, but a kind of a, a industry event. And we were in a, a public um, space that we had rented. And they basically had the network segmented into different segments so that right from the network, you would say the, you know, what you plug into these ports can talk to each other. What you plug in over there is completely separate. And they Got did it. that so that multiple vendors at a different show were not able to kind of connect to each other's gear mm -hmm. or disturb each other's gear. Um, so I would say it depends a little bit on the venue network, um, but there's nothing inside of, other than the grouping capability in NDI, there's nothing to securely prevent someone from discovering your NDI signals on the network. So you do need to have a, a secure segment of the net, network if that's what you're worried about. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna skip this next question because we've already answered it. Uh, well, actually it's different. Are there plans to add H.265 to Perl 2? Um, <laughs> and it's also one of the also one of the biggest improvement in NDI HX2. I don't know if that's a question. Do you know anything about NDI HX2? I think you answered that before. You said that you have no idea if H265 is part of NDI, and neither do I. So maybe I we can move don't. on. Don't. Um, so now I'm going to have to go look and see if I'm yeah, missing something. Yeah, you got there. me curious. Um, so I like these questions. Yeah. Keep them coming, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's not one I'm familiar with. So yeah. if AG, if HEVC is coming to NDI, that'd be cool. But I I don't know that that's mm -hmm. the case. Or maybe they'll skip it and do H266. Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's a very popular question. A lot of people want to know about latency. How much? Uh, and does it depend on network traffic or resolution? Like, how do you, can you just give a rundown on NDI and latency and how to measure it and what influences it? I noticed there was another question here, someone asking, with an NDI converter, do you then get more latency as well? So uh, um, what do you know? I, it, the latency is generally quite small. So they're in the order of a frame or so, sometimes two frames. Um, oh, okay. So it's, it's generally pretty low. Um, so at 60 frames per second, that's, you know, in the 16 to 30 millisecond range. Um, that's pretty good latency. Uh, if you go with the HX version, sometimes there's slightly more latency there. And just because of the way it's encoding, the way it, the way it gets the, the signal compressed all the way down to eight megabits or four megabits is there's some interframe encoding and things in there. So you may experience a little bit more delay if on the HX signals, and that's certainly been our experience is things that mm -hmm. are generating NDI HX will have at least a couple frames delay. Um, the ones that are pure NDI or native NDI tend to be quite fast. 
Um, will it depend on the network bandwidth? I would say not directly. Uh, as long as you have sufficient bandwidth to get the NDI signal through, the the latency through the network is more based on the number of hops. And I guess if you have a very congested router, um, then yes, you could be queuing up inside your router. Um, but generally speaking, the latency is on the encode and the decode side. The network is usually quite fast at passing the NDI packets through. Yeah, I um, see. Did, right. I, did I cover all of that? Question. I think so. So it's basically, it's a property of your network. If there's any other reason for congestion in your network, your NDI uh, would experience the same kind of congestion. And all yes. NDI does is encode it and decode it at the end. And after that, it's up to your network. So Yeah, and um, that's, I would say, one of the caveats. We didn't, you know, we didn't really talk about any of the downsides or the or or the challenges of NDI and that is certainly one of them is that because it is fairly high bandwidth um, and because it's so easily discoverable across the network it's fairly easy um, for people who just go oh I want to monitor that signal and someone else also wants to right. monitor that signal and someone else decides they want to switch that s signal somewhere you could overload your network or a network switch quite easily inadvertently if you're not careful with NDI because there's nothing preventing that from occurring. Um, mm -hmm. We mentioned mm -hmm. really early on in the webinar, there is the capability to do multicast in NDI. So NDI does support multicast. So if you're in an environment where you know that there's going to be many, many people interested in monitoring or that signal's going to many places, I recommend you look into the multicast capability. But that does require a multicast IP network, IGMP. Sure, sure. Um, but once you have that kind of infrastructure, NDI certainly supports multicast. So all that said is you can efficiently use NDI on a multicast network. But if you don't have a multicast network, it is fairly easy to get tripped up accidentally and overload a switch that would cause congestion that would not only affect delay, but a lot could have pretty severe packet loss and other things there. So you mm -hmm. do have to be a little cautious with NDI. It, it's by nature, it's very open and easy to use, but that means kind of use with caution. Uh, it is fairly easy to ask too much of the network when you're moving these very large signals around. Right. So this next question is one we get for uh, every webinar, which is from Boris. He's asking us, you have the best picture and sound I've seen in a live webinar. How do you achieve it? And Boris, we usually have a diagram that we can pull up to show that. I don't know if we have that today, but uh, basically Dave and I, I so. are both coming from our homes and we're sending SRT signals. So that's another whole uh, ball of wax to talk about SRT. But if you want to send really high quality signals uh, over the internet, SRT is really good for that. And so Dave and I both have a Perl system in our house and we're sending SRT signals to another Perl system. And that's our production Perl. And then from there, we're live streaming to Crowdcast. So that's how we're doing today's program. Um, next question is from uh, Louis. Uh, is there a big difference between an NDI camera that goes on Wi-Fi and one that goes on an Ethernet gigabit cable? The router is set 20 feet from it. So how would Wi-Fi influence this uh, NDI ecosystem? I probably am not the most experienced person to talk about NDI on Wi-Fi in general if you're using the HX version maybe you can get away with it if your Wi-Fi is very good um, but in general I would really avoid Wi-Fi uh, with NDI especially native NDI because then you're talking about hundreds of megabits for your signal um, <laughs> right. you have to have a, an extremely well engineered uh, Wi-Fi network, and even then, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not an. I'm not yeah, a yeah, Wi-Fi yeah, expert. Yeah, For yeah. me, when I when I deal with NDI, I plug it in. I'd be very leery of of uh, of NDI on a on a wireless network. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. Uh, it's basically just general good advice around uh, sending video, video signal. Uh, if you can use an Ethernet cable compared to Wi-Fi, it's going to go better. And I know this from very uh, personal experience doing webinars <laughs> from this room over Wi-Fi where my signal has gone down. So now I have an Ethernet cable uh, that's long enough to reach my router. So um, I, I next, <laughs> uh, how well does NDI work in a multi-camera 4K TV broadcast scenario? So four to eight cameras. Um, uh, 
again, you're going to need a, a, a fairly hefty network to do that. Um, if mm -hmm. you're doing 4K, you're looking at, you know, six to 800 megabits uh, per source there. Yeah. Now, I can't remember, did they say 4K 30 or 4K 60? They didn't specify, just 4K. Okay, because if it's 4K 30, it might be a little, you know, a little less than that, but you're really starting to push the boundaries of gigabit ethernet um, when you get up to that range. So if you have the infrastructure, meaning each of those individual connections from your NDI cameras or sources are gigabit ethernet, and you're going into a pretty hefty switch that has say a 10 gigabit ethernet going out and your production gear has a 10 gig ethernet in, then I think it would work reasonably well. And what if it's um, NDI HX? NDI HX, again, then then you'd be okay. Yeah, yes. that could operate on a, on a standard gigabit ethernet network uh, without any issue. Yeah. yeah, so you can kind of do the math on these things. It's really very finite. Uh, so if you found out, find out if you're using NDI or NDI HX, you can see that data transfer speed and see how much network you have available to you and come up with that number. So yep. hopefully you have a nice big fat network uh, and you can do all this nice stuff. Yeah, and the other thing you'll need to just be conscious of is there are usually limits on the production switcher or whatever piece of gear you're going into with all these cameras yeah, sure, on sure. how many NDI signals it can terminate, especially if they're 4K. So you're gonna want the network bandwidth, um, but even if that is um, kind of H.264 based and the, the bandwidth's not too high, there's usually a limit of how many uh, NDI based signals you can bring into any one piece of gear at a time. So you just wanna right. check those two things, but if you're if you're engineering those two things well, then then it works quite well to do switching among mm -hmm. those, those sources. Um, so we just got a note from our, uh product manager for our Perl systems who let us know that uh, NDI HX2 is supported on Perl 2 and it's part of NDI 4. So that's probably why we haven't spoken of it, Dave. It's just embedded into that uh, latest okay. version of NDI. I don't know what you get with NDI HX2, what that really means, but... Uh, I'm going to have to go check it out after the yeah, webinar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> going to learn something. Go today. watch that's a webinar great. on NDI somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So... Uh, are the cable length limitations the same for NDI on Cat5 and Cat6 as other standards? Like 100, mil, 100 meters of cable still the limit? Uh, That's a question the, from Vince. Yeah, it's. The, uh, I think if the question is, if I'm carrying NDI on a network cable, do I get the same distance limitation on that network cable as I would for any other network traffic? The answer is yes. So NDI is, is just the same kind of IP packets across that, that link. So if you've got a hundred meter uh, kind of restriction on your cat five or whatever, that would apply whether it's carrying NDI or, or anything else. Um, if the question is more the distance I can cover on a cat five running NDI versus something like SDI or HDMI, those are all different. So HDMI is, is quite short. Uh, SDI has quite long lengths. Um, when you get into IP networks, you get a range of cables also. So you can go, you can go just over a cat five, you can go over cat six, you can go over fiber. Um, so depending on what physical media you have, you can achieve different lengths and, you know, ethernet can go or IP networks can go a very long distance over fiber and those kind of things. So mm -hmm. it's not a straightforward answer unless the question is, is NDI special in any way when it comes to packet uh, lengths and, and in that case, no. Right. Yeah, we did a live show on this. So every every Thursday at three o'clock Eastern time, we're live on YouTube and Facebook where we talk about video technology. And we did one uh, maybe three or four or 27 months ago about uh, how much data you can send, how far you can run your Ethernet cables before they uh, degrade. So uh, right. look through our back catalog on YouTube and you might find that. Um, and also tune into the show. We'll be live here tomorrow at, uh, right now, actually, uh, 24 hours from now. So uh, tune in if you're around. Um, yeah. This webinar is being recorded. It will be shared. Uh, you can access all of our webinars, uh, our upcoming webinars and our past webinars on our website at epifan.com slash webinars. Uh, and we have a whole bunch more planned for the next couple of months. So be sure to check that out. Um, and here's another question, Dave, regarding... Um, control aspect of NDI because we talked about how it's a two-way 
system where you're sending video one way and you can send control the other way. Do you know if you yeah. can control a camera, like a, you know what a CCU is, a camera control unit mm -hmm. um, over NDI? Uh, we talked about PTZ control, but have you heard of a yep. CCU kind of control? Yeah, well, the, it's, so there's more than just the pan tilt zoom that you can control over the NDI. So um, I believe it's, it's not purely visca, but it's it's similar in in kind of scope. So, if you want to, is it their own? Do they have their own uh, uh, version of control, or do they support existing control systems? Like I think it's visca. I think it's their own. Um, okay. So I think it's specific to NDI. That's something I haven't looked at in probably a year and a half now. So I'm a little yeah, rusty, yeah. but um, but you can control pretty much all the aspects of the camera. So you know shutter speed and aperture and all this kind of stuff. Um, white balance, whatever. Um, so I don't know that it's a full traditional CCU, but certainly um, when you take that to mean the most popular kind of things that you wanna control in a camera, certainly um, that's the case. So it's more than just the pan tilt zoom. You can get into the focal, um, you know, focusing the camera, the aperture, shutter speed, all of that kind of stuff. So all the typical camera control um, you can do. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just reading ahead in the questions here. Um, do converters add latency if I buy an NDI converter? Um, yes, relative to if, if, you know, if you're comparing, I run you know, SDI mm -hmm. or HDMI versus I put a converter in there and go NDI. Yes, there will be a little bit of latency introduced when you're doing that encoding. Um, but uh, if we're comparing, say, a camera that inherently supports NDI versus one where you put a converter in front, I'm not sure that the converter, the separate converter would add any more latency than the built-in kind of NDI support inside the camera. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. They're all uh, here's fairly some... low latency because the, the protocol is meant to be as low latency as possible. So most of the converters and most of the technology built into cameras and other sources is trying to be as low latency as possible. Okay. Here's another one. We've kind of talked, talk, talked about this earlier. Um, is it better to create your own network on a location than use a hotel's network? That's from Brent. And I, I saw some people here in the chat earlier slagging hotel networks saying I would never use them. And uh, I guess they don't trust them because they're not their own. Do you have any words of, of wisdom about uh, using somebody else's network versus setting up your own network? I would say if you can set up your own network, by all means, yes, set up your own network. Um, <laughs> yeah. But there may be scenarios in which it's just not feasible to run a cable across the lobby, uh, you know, or this kind of thing. So if you're in like a large ballroom and you have the ability to run cables and tape them to the floor or whatever, absolutely. I would do that first before using the network venue infrastructure for sure. Um, but when it comes to doing overflow rooms or bringing cameras in that are a little more remote or whatever, they may not, that just may not be an option for mm -hmm. running your own physical cable across the lobby or, or the parking lot or whatever you need to do. So definitely, if you're in an environment where you can kind of run your own cables, that's absolutely what I would do first. Right. Um, avoids all kinds of complications. Um, but there may be scenarios where you need to use the hotel network. Um, and if it's done right, if it's partitioned for you um, properly, it, it can be good. But it's hit and miss if you don't go to that hotel all the time and you don't know. Yeah, you have there. to have a lot of it's trust. A, you have some trust. It's a bit of a landmine to, to go and just trust mm -hmm. their, their network for sure. Um, okay, here's another easy one, which is, is NDI a one-to-one -one connection or uh, could I send one signal per NDI to multiple screens? Uh, I think the answer is yes. You can. It's not a one-to-one -one connection between an NDI sender and receiver, so you can receive it in multiple places. You just have to be aware that those will add to your network network overhead. Anybody who's yeah. watching it will, will add up, those will eventually stack up in your network and could cause problems. Yeah, from an IP perspective, if I monitor that signal, let's say I have a camera and I model, monitor at three locations on the same network, that will appear as three unicast flows across the network. So in that way, it's kind of one-to-one, -one, but it's, it's 
it's switched obviously it's packet switched yeah. across the network um there is the ability as we talked earlier about using multicast so if you have multicast capability in your ip network if you're running igmp and and you've and you've got that set up there is the ability to configure most um ndi sources to use the multicast address and then to be able to use your router to replicate that stream across the network in which case it's no longer a one-to-one -one. so it really depends how you set it up um, and as george mentioned if you don't choose the multicast option you are going to be congesting your network with each of those additional kind of monitoring mm -hmm. points or receivers that you place on the network Paul here is telling us that he did a multi-site conference using hotel IP network, 600 pounds a day, and it was connected to a hotel free public network. Whoa. So good for you, Paul. I hope it went well. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, we'll jump back into these questions. What's the best way to record ISO feeds from a multi-camera NDI setup? Uh, you could do this with Perl, obviously. Our Perl 2 systems, uh, you could ingest a number of NDI signals. What what other ways would you recommend for that, Dave? Yeah, I think in the NDI tool set, so there's a, there's, um, a set of NDI tools provided by NewTek. Um, and in there, there is, there is uh, recording uh, capable. Mm -hmm. So if you were routing your ISOs across the NDI network to a machine or set of machines, um, and you're running those NDI tools, you could perform recording uh, inside of those. Similarly, you know, if you're running OBS or Adobe or some of these other programs, they have recording capability and, and built in for, for NDI. So you have kind of a, a pretty broad range of choices there. I think if you have many ISOs and you want them all co-located in one spot, then look at the NDI tools um, for their studio monitor, I believe it's called, um, has capability to record. So that, that might be the most convenient um, unless you've already got something like a, a Pearl for other reasons where you're doing switching and other things and right. then you want to just use that also to record the ISOs. Okay. Um, still a number of questions here, which is great. Uh, we'll hang out here for a while and answer these questions. If you wanna hang out with us, uh, by all means, uh, it's great having you all here. And, and it's nice to see there's so much interest in NDI. So, uh, and I like reading these stories about people how they've been using NDI in the past. So if you have any great stories you want to share, put them in the chat here. Um, there are some poll questions still up too. So if you want to take a look at those polls and throw in your yeah. feedback, uh, we'd love to know uh, how you're using NDI. So here's someone who's talking about um, Steph uh, is, uh, has a huddle cam, HD NDI HX, and he cannot see it on the IP network uh, because the camera is on a subnet and his network is on a different subnet. So yes, how does that work? Yeah, so, so the discovery protocol inside of NDI relies on, on a lower layer protocol called MDNS. And MDNS relies on basically broadcast packets on, on that subnet. So by default, the routers will not pass those broadcast messages from one subnet to the other. So the discovery uh, protocol kind of breaks if you go across subnets and that's a little bit deliberate because uh, um, IP networking if you if you broadcast everywhere you can easily bring down the entire network so the whole yes, idea is that right. you put machines that need to communicate on the same subnet with one another um, however if you do need to get from one source to another across subnets there is a way to do it with NDI but you need to know the IP address of the source of the NDI source that you're trying to receive. Um, you can't just rely on the auto discovery or the built-in discovery from NDI because it won't cross from one subnet to the other. So it's best if you can get them on the same subnet. If you can't, then you've got to find out IP addresses and do a little right. more work to connect them up, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a suggestion here for a topic from uh, uh, Angel. Uh, NDI and Wirecast, or NDI and vMix, or NDI and OBS. Which one to choose? And thank you. That's a that's a great idea. We could yeah. do a whole show on NDI tools. And ultimately, I think you're going to find out is which of those tools do you like best? Because the NDI part of it is going to be really straightforward for all of them, I'm sure. Uh, and just like we've yeah. done a lot of programs and, and on our YouTube channel, you can see where we've compared streaming software. 
and they all have their advantages. So I'd suggest go check out our YouTube channel and you can might help you try to pick which streaming software you want to use. Uh, OBS, as you know, is really powerful. You can do anything with it, but it's also kind of dangerous in that it's free or it's an open source program. So it can sometimes go a little haywire. Yeah, and it can be a little complicated to get everything yes. configured the way you expect in OBS. But if that's what you're comfortable with, it certainly does NDI very well. So so as George said, I think it's really going to depend on what else you want to use that program for and what your preference is there. If yeah, you like the yeah. way Telestream mm -hmm. does things or the way that OBS does things just in general in terms of switching and, and choosing sources. The NDI portion is going to be quite similar, I think, in each of those. But it's not a bad discussion for maybe a live show we could compare those and just see if that's the case yeah absolutely see how similar um, they are we have a story here from jason vaughn talking about how he uses ndi uh he's right. using it for lower thirds just like we are so he uses the after effects plugin to get motion awesome. graphics into a production so that's great to hear uh he's talking about media servers like watch out and millennium support uh ndi as well so uh, this oh, is cool. nice to see people are using it for more than just bringing in camera feeds, but also for graphics and things like that. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, yeah, here's another. to see if anyone's using it for media playback because we've played around a little bit with that um, and we've done lots with graphics, but um, I'm curious to see whether others are out there using it for pure media playback and if so, what, whether that's through Adobe or whether that's um, through some other program. Yeah. Um, uh, Jason, the same person, has a comment about how he'd like to see uh, it set up on how to output via NDI and connect via NDI monitor because uh, he's having trouble with it. Um, he's not able oh, okay. to discover it on his LAN with his NDI monitor. So what I'd suggest to you, Jason, is go to our website and start a live chat. Uh, the, our support team is amazing. They will love to help you try to walk through a problem like that. Um, if you haven't reached out to them before, I suggest you go there because they're really good at this kind of thing. And yep. maybe we will do a, a show on that kind of thing, how to do outputting NDI and, and what you can do with it that way because uh, uh, more people might be interested in that. Sure. Okay, this one is from Paul. So if I were to set up a full remote production workflow with talent to be remote, I would need everyone who was looking for live NDI access to be on the same VPN with a transport time over the internet of less than 150 milliseconds. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that's the best application for NDI. I think um, while you might be able to make that work, I think probably SRT is maybe the better choice there for bringing in remote gas over public infrastructure yeah. at least so that, that's, that's what we're what doing we here found. today yeah yeah and uh it's it's kind of similar to, to to ndi um but it's more of a one-to-one -one relationship where you do have to enter credentials at one end and you have to kind of receive it at the other end and go okay we're connected now so yeah i'd suggest paul check out some of the srt uh tools you can use pearl systems uh, like we have here, but there's also SRT encoders for computers and for phones and things like that as well. So, yeah, we did maybe a webinar either either last week or the week before on on SRT. So something similar to this, but all focused on SRT. Um, if you're going over kind of distance and public uh, networks, I I encourage you, especially if you're bringing in remote guests to a production, I think SRT is probably better suited than NDI for for that. Yeah. Yeah, not really for public IP transport, exclamation mark, as Steve Irwin says in the chat. So right on, yep. Steve. Um, okay, more questions here. This is great. We'll, we'll keep going here. We're, we're getting to the end of them, I think. Um, would it be possible to use NDI to work offline without network connection in a conference show setting to run multiple? I'm not quite sure your question there, Dean but can you work offline with NDI? Well, you need to have a local area network uh, to work on okay. with NDI, that's how it works, but you don't need to be, it doesn't need to be going to the public internet at all. So uh, you can totally work. Oh, I see locally. what you're saying. Yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah, it can operate in an isolated network for sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. There's no need for any kind of uh, you know cloud connection or, or anything like that. It, it can be 
your completely isolated network, just a network switch and a few cables, and it will operate over that for sure. Yeah, and we're going to have customers who are concerned about security. They're doing some kind of internal meeting, and they don't want it to even sniff the outside world. There's no question you could still use NDI in that application. Correct. Yeah, just secure um, the network. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. We're getting to the end here. My, Air I know that because my AirPods are dying. So. <laughs> Okay. Um, I have a gigabit network with just a couple of devices on it. I use NDI a lot, especially with my Pearl 2. Once in a while, an NDI input freezes or completely drops out and then comes back. Is there any way to get telemetry data on what's happening to those packets within Pearl 2? Or is there a way to give NDI packets a priority um, over others mm. to keep these issues from happening? So... I'll take the second question first. Um, is there a way to give priority? Not not in the Perl itself, because at that point, you basically were, were either going to receive those or were not. And I, I would suspect that those packets aren't being dropped inside of the Perl. Um, there may be ways on your network, depending on what kind of switches or routers you're using in your network, to be able to create either separate VPNs or different quality of service for, for those different... Uh, you know, for your NDI streams, that's kind of a uh, related but separate topic all about just mm -hmm. network quality of service and how do you ensure certain flows have priorities over others. There's, there are ways in the network in general to do that. Your first question about are there statistics inside of Perl to diagnose kind of where those things went wrong? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. So I think you'll need to contact our support guys and ask that question um, I know that in Perl there is um, there is an option to go get more detailed logs than what you would just kind of see on the main interface and there may well be some stuff in the logs I don't know but that's definitely something that our support guys could help you walk through to see if when that's happening in your network, whether there's some statistics or some details on Perl that might help you determine what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we'll move on here. Uh, can PTZ be controlled uh, via NDI? And the answer is yes. That's a question from Mike. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, and I would say, I would just caveat that with provided the gear supports it. So, um, when we talked about interoperability on on NDI, in terms of carrying the video and encoding, decoding, all of that is pretty standard NDI. When it comes to some of the more advanced stuff like camera control or tally, there's some equipment that supports that and some equipment that does not. So there'll be equipment that will say, yes, we support NDI, but they don't necessarily support tally functionality or they don't necessarily support camera control. And that's, that's the case with Perl 2. So Perl 2 does support both receiving uh, and transmitting of NDI signals, but we don't support um, the, you know, the tally part of it or the control part of it at the moment. Um, we support alpha, but we don't support necessarily tally or control. So um, the answer is NDI can do it. You'll just have to check specifically with the equipment that you're connecting together that both of them actually support those features because they are optional it's not mandatory to support the control part in right in ndi to say that you're an ndi device okay well i want to shout out here to mateo saita i'm probably mispronouncing your last name i'm sorry about that uh, you've been answering a lot of these questions coming in so thanks very much for that uh, in fact awesome. we're going to skip over some of these questions because you've done such a good job <laughs> answering them that's great. Uh, we have a question here from IT Services, who is also very good at answering other people's questions, I recall, from this webinar and previous webinars. Um, he has a question about uh, Perl 2. Can Perl 2 take an existing channel or an HDMI source and output it as an NDI stream, which could then put into an NDI virtual stream and use it as a webcam source for Zooms or Teams, effectively turning our expensive Creston camera system, which is an HDMI input in our Perl 2 into a fancy webcam. Uh, yes. So I don't see so why not. Yeah, is, you sure could. Yeah. Yeah, the answer is yes, you could absolutely do that. Um, mm -hmm. No problem. 
it takes a little um, tinkering on the on the zoom end <laughs> but uh for the pearl side that's very easy yeah you bring in hdmi or sdi no problem put it in a channel and then just create a an ndi output stream for that channel and and then on the receive side you just have to be sure to convert it to a virtual signal for your zoom um using yeah. ndi tools it works yeah okay uh is there a tool to bring dante into an ndi stream such as the io of a dsp uh again that's a little bit like the question of hd base t um there's no direct um, kind of bridge or the, there's no protocol or anything to convert one to the other but there may be some equipment that supports both where you could kind of get dante audio convert it to just pure pcm and then re-encode it onto an ndi stream um but there's no there's no specific way to to kind of extract audio from NDI and put it directly onto Dante other than a device that supports both of those and is probably processing that audio in, in between. Um, so they are completely separate protocols, but there may well be gear that supports both Dante and NDI and you could in that case redirect. But I, I think there's no such thing currently on NDI as a audio only stream. I could be wrong about that, but I, I haven't come across any application where people are carrying just pure audio without any video stream on NDI. That's something I will ask our support team about afterwards. So I got a couple questions I need to research here. Yeah, this is great. We're learning a few things, which is always nice for us. Um, okay, we have a question here. Uh, uh, people asking, would NDI work on a webcast or X2? The answer is no. Um, uh, somebody asked, what is a Perl 2 system or what is a Perl? And a Perl is a hardware encoder. Uh, we've talked about it previously in this webinar, and it's uh, one of our flagship products used for uh, bringing in video signals. You can do switching, streaming, and recording on them. And we support NDI on those uh, hardware encoders. So speaking of Perl, we have a, a pretty neat question for you here, Dave, from Philip. Okay. Perl to Perl. Does it encode the compression decision data? so that the next box makes the same compression decisions or does each box end up compressing the artifacts of the one before? You know what I mean by that? Yep, I do. Yeah. Um, and the answer is it's, it's the latter. There's no yeah. sort of coordination of the yeah. compression from one box to the next. Um, so when we, if you were to send from Perl A to Perl B, uh, we would compress in Perl A and when we receive it in Perl B, we would completely decompress that video so that we have just raw video. And if that video needed to go out again as NDI somewhere, we would compress it again. And there's there's no coordination between those two compression tasks. Right. Um, usually when people are doing that, there's a compositing or, or some kind of switching in between that would make it impossible to just relay any kind of compression information because normally... Like if we're doing something like you see here with a two up of George and myself, if we were two NDI feeds coming into Perl, we would completely decode those. We'd end up with raw video. We would composite them into a new image or frame, and then we would encode that frame from scratch. But because that frame really doesn't have anything in common with the first frame other than the source video, that would be a completely independent encoding. So to answer your question, most times it's not needed. and even in our case in Perl 2, if you were just relaying NDI from one link to the next through a Perl, it would re-encode completely and independently. Right. Okay. Um, is NDI routable outside of a LAN? Uh, we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, there's nothing about NDI that is built for sending to the public internet. It's just not what that protocol does. But there are ways to wrap an NDI uh, output as something that is good for going outside of your land, such as SRT. So, and there's tools that do right. that for you. So there's there's infrastructure in place there that can help you get your NDI signals out to the public internet, but it's really not part of NDI. It's a whole other can of worms. So uh, check out SRT, yeah. you, you, that might be something uh, that might help you there. Yeah, so yeah, in short, there are ways to do it, you know, VPNs and others, but uh, it's, it's not the general use case for NDI um, mm -hmm. to, to try to get it off of the LAN and, and going somewhere else. It's really meant to be a local um, kind of switching and networking protocol. Right. 
So uh, Dean's asking where he can sign up for future uh, webinars. So Dean, if you subscribe to our email list, you'll get uh, probably some kind of digest that'll tell you what's coming up with our webinars. I don't think we have a specific uh, webinar sign up sheet, but I would start there. Just sign up for our newsletter and you should get everything you need. Uh, right. And maybe we need a specific webinar sign up sheet. So thanks for pointing <laughs> that out. <laughs> yeah. um, Tom is asking, do the outboard converters add latency? Uh, I guess we answered this before, and the answer is like any other piece of equipment, right? Yeah, there'll be some small amount of latency, likely a frame or two um, yeah. for most converters. Um, I know we've we've worked with the new Tech Spark. We've looked at the Bird Dog ones, a couple others, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, they all have a little bit of latency, but as I mentioned, um, NDI is meant to be as low latency as possible because it's primarily in a pre-production environment or a production environment. So it's not in the distribution side. So it's everybody's trying to do it with the least amount of latency as possible. But yes, there will always be some latency on the encoding. Okay. So I think we should probably wrap up soon. There's a bunch of questions in here, but I just don't know if anybody's still around here because these are kind of older questions, but uh, we'll go through a, a last couple. And if you have any questions, stick them in there now uh, or, or upvote your own question and we'll make sure we get to it. So okay. the, uh, Christopher wants to know how we're doing our back channel for our communication. Uh, he's suspecting that it's Zoom and you are right on the mark. Yep. Um, I'm getting after what is best practice to collaborate remotely in order to keep things in sync. So we are using SRT to do our signals and we have a little bit of control over our latency with SRT as well. So when it comes to our, our audio and video signals for the broadcast, we can actually align those up. And then um, we are using Zoom as a back channel. So I'm listening to, to Dave right now over Zoom and, and looking at him too in a separate camera feed. So it kind of helps to have those two things isolated. I just, um, how, I just noticed Cameron mentioned uh, that Dean can follow our Crowdcast account for updates. Um, so uh, if you're good looking tip. for those webinars, you can go into Crowdcast and follow all of our webinars. That way we do all of our webinars over Crowdcast. So that is one way you can do it. Um, or you can go to epifan.com slash webinars and it'll at least give you a list of the upcoming webinars and you can sign up for those there. Mm-hmm. So one more question for you here. Um, how is lip sync locked or assured? So are there any ways to adjust the sync or, or latency when it comes to NDI, Dave? Um, not that I'm aware of, not, not, in the, um, not in the protocol itself. I think the idea is to keep it synchronized and, and our experience is that the protocol does a pretty good job of that. So for example, um, if you're running analog audio directly in somewhere and then you're going to encode video, you may need to have an adjustment to that analog audio at the source just to give it the right alignment. Once it's encoded and on the network, um, all of that stuff is time stamped together. Um, so once you're kind of encoded as NDI, as you go through your network, you shouldn't experience any kind of differential jitter between your audio and your video causing sync issues that didn't exist at the source, if that makes sense. So I think as long as you take care of it at the source, um, then the protocol itself should keep everything together to the point where it gets decoded again. Right. Um, but with anything like we talked about, there being a couple, you know, seconds or sorry, not seconds, a couple frames of delay and that kind of thing. Um, you do have to make sure that things are aligned right at, at the start. Um, but through the network, you shouldn't experience any kind of additional skew or jitter because um, the protocol has everything kind of synced together. Right. So I think we should probably wrap this up here, Dave. We've gone through, uh, I think we've gone through all the questions and I do apologize if I've missed any here. I've been kind of scrolling up and down through our lists here. Uh, if you still have questions, go to our um, website, epifen.com and start a live chat. Our support team is really, really uh, smart. And they will have those answers. So uh, talk to them there uh, and you can call us and you can book demos to see our Perl systems as well. So uh, let us know how you, how you want to learn more about our Perl systems and uh, we'll give you everything you want to know. So uh, Dave, thanks. This has been great. And uh, thanks to everybody here for watching. Uh, All right. We'll be back here. Well, we'll be back on YouTube tomorrow at three o'clock. So come look for That's us. That's right. Then.
Yeah. Okay. See you later. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>